Hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of Core Balance Coaching. And this isn't just any week, it's a little bit of a special week. Uh, it's my first week back after missing last week. That was the, only, the second uh, stream I've missed in about two years almost of doing this. Uh, the first week I missed was uh, the week my son was born. So I'm happy to be back. And sorry I wasn't there for you guys uh, last week, which was uh, my birthday, and also I was traveling for Thanksgiving on that day. Uh, so the other thing that makes this week a little bit special is that uh, it's my last time streaming from this beautiful office. I've called my home for the last two and a half years, and uh, my family has moved. This is uh, this is you know an office that's at at our home we we live in a one bedroom uh, or we used to and and uh, we've moved to a bigger place because our family has grown this year so um, this is the last time you'll see me here and I'll be streaming from a new place uh, starting next week now let's get to the fun stuff so uh, this week is um, we're gonna be demonstrating a new lesson for core, that's gonna be going into the core balance training program it's a new plank lesson, and I'm just going to show you guys the raw footage that we filmed uh, this just this morning. I've been doing plank all morning. My core feels nice and active, and uh, there we, we actually filmed probably five or six lessons this morning, all related to the plank and the side plank, and we're going to be progressively uh, you know, teaching people those exercises in the program over multiple days. So the what I'm about to show you is just day one lesson of progressing into the plank. I thought that would be the most appropriate. And um, I'll answer any questions and share any other thoughts uh, after I show it. So why don't I show it right now? And then we will do the student hub, student of the week, as we always do, and uh, answer live Q&A from the chat. So here we go. Uh, this is the new plank uh, part one lesson. One of the mottos of this program is it's not what you do, it's how you do it. That applies to all exercises and especially the plank. So what we're gonna do is we're going to gradually and progressively work towards a full plank over multiple days. And most of you have probably done the plank before and I want you to try and forget everything you know about the plank and we're gonna learn how to do it with the core anchors and that's gonna change your perspective while doing the exercise, which is going to completely change the exercise. The core engagement is the how. And so if you haven't done the plank before, that's totally fine because we're gonna, like I said, gradually get into this and it's gonna be a very easy step-by-step -step process to go to a plank. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna progress from the, uh, the front anchors challenge exercise. So you're gonna get into the quadruped position, uh, just like you did from module three, and we're gonna to connect to our anchors. So for me, what that means is I'm gonna push away from my upper front anchor and my lower front anchor. So pubic bone is going towards the ground and my rib cage is pushing, keeping my upper body open. And so that is the front anchors and the back anchor is always a little bit engaged where I'm just gently pushing, connecting my, the bottom of my rib cage in the back to the invisible floor above me. So that engages my core in a nice healthy way. I can check that I'm getting fat. I don't have like a abdominal hollowing and I'm not doughboy. So, so here it is again, connect. And the way we're gonna progressively get into the plank is we're just gonna walk our arms forward while staying connected and breathing, okay? And as you do that, your hips are gonna open and your pubic bone is going to be able to come forward more. You can see this is kind of like a hip hinge motion or a bridge. And so you can just start with that. And you might want to start, you might want to alternate which hand you move forward first. This is about quality over how far, how far you go. It doesn't matter how far you go. What matters is that you're staying connected, that you feel a strong engagement in your core and that you're using the core anchors as your guide. And so the goal over time, whenever you're comfortable, is to get into a full 
hip open position, and then you can eventually drop your elbows down into the first stage of the plank, which is a plank on the knees. And this can be a static exercise where you're gonna be focusing on breathing, so it's never really static. Don't hold your breath. Breathing into your lower back. If you're finding that you start to slouch forward, like some people do in the plank, push away from that upper front anchor. If you feel like your back is starting to arch or, or sag, push away from that, that back anchor and the lower front anchor, and that'll make sure you're not arching your back, pubic bone stays forward. If you wanna turn this into a dynamic exercise, you can actually alternate between being up on your hands and down on your elbows. So this adds a little bit of a push-up component, but this is all just extra bells and whistles, and it does not take the place of the priority, which is staying connected and breathing. And you can check periodically. If you have the ability, make sure you're not dough boy, make sure you're not sucking your tummy in. And that would be stage one of the plank. All right, so everything working okay there? So um, that is part one of the plank progression that's gonna go into the program. The next lesson is gonna be progressing into the full plank, and then there is a dynamic plank lesson after that. The other uh, thing that we are putting in is a progression into the side plank, and um, then we, we also add a dynamic side plank as well and with the side plank we I, I do talk more about addressing left right muscle imbalances than i do in the original what i call the one core balance training 1.0 side plank lesson so this is going to be more tailored for people who you know with left right imbalances scoliosis and stuff like that so i'm excited to get these all edited up uh, as mentioned that was just raw footage unedited that um, is going to be a little, a little more dressed up before it goes into the program. And uh, all that stuff takes time. So, so we'll be getting all those in there as soon as possible. And those are things that are later in the program, maybe like module. Uh, the plank is module or uh, phase two, some, somewhere maybe like module eight, seven or eight. And then the side plank, I think is phase three, somewhere in module 10 or something like that. So if you're still early in the program, you may uh, have, you, these may already be implemented by the time you get to those lessons. And uh, if you're not there, it's still okay to try this stuff, uh, you know, in, in and experiment with it uh, now. So yeah, give it a shot, just take it slow, take it easy. That's one of the things that I emphasize again and again throughout all those lessons that we filmed. So I see that there are some questions in the chat related to the side plank. So. That's or to the regular plank. So that's what I'm gonna do first. I'd like to prioritize people who are here live. So let's see what what we're working with here. So I think that the first one is here, Barbara Dickinson. Let me see if I can scroll up um, and see if there are any other plank questions, and then we will be. Oh, I see Sherry. I see a message from Sherry, which I'm going to get back to um, as well. So I'm going to go back up to the top of the chat here after I just answer some plank related questions. So the first one, like I said, I think Barbara Dickinson doing a plank feels like driving a spike up into my right shoulder. Slap repair years ago. How to modify. So definitely is going to be a lot of pressure on anyone that has a torn rotator cuff. And so my suggestion for people with shoulder pain, sharp shoulder pain, uh, that's the ki kind of pain you're gonna feel uh, if you have a torn rotator cuff and you weight bear too much weight on your shoulder, is you're gonna modify this by doing it up against a, maybe in the beginning, a wall. So you're gonna get your feet back. I can actually demonstrate right now. Um, 
let's see, which wall do I want to use? I'll just use this one here. And we'll see if we can do this. So standing up against the wall is, uh, is not much challenging, but if you bring your feet back and you lean up against the wall, you can practice the plank at a very modified degree with not very much pressure on your shoulders. And it's not gonna be very intense in your core either. And so that would be a way to do it and you can keep moving your feet back and you're gonna walk your hands down as you do that. And so apply everything from the lesson to the wall plank or the wall push up. And you can also, you can also do it on a, a more incline surface or decline surface, however you wanna look at it. So that would be like doing it on the back of a couch um, you know, if you want to progress further than what you can do on a wall, uh, that's, that's what I would recommend. So you can do it outside. If you have a railing, you know, a, in like a metal railing that they have at like schools and stuff, uh, is a, is a great sturdy thing to just hold on to and, and do that kind of thing on the back of a couch. Like I said, your countertop, if it's sturdy, um, and, and you can get, and you can bring that even lower by doing it on, um, you know, the the seat of a chair, or and just get creative and find things that are lower and work your way down to, towards the floor. And as you're doing that, so this is for Barbara, your shoulder will develop more stability and more what's called co-contraction of the muscles around the shoulder joint. All those little rotator cuff muscles get stronger and are able to stabilize your shoulder better to tolerate more weight bearing. And so yes, the shoulder and the rotator cuff can progress and gradually build um, re resilience over time, just like your core and your spine. So uh, great question there. And let's see if I can um, look for any other plank related questions. I don't know if I, oh, uh, uh, there's just a comment. You like the progression and the dynamic. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, so I think that was maybe the only plank question that I saw. So we're gonna go up and uh, Barbara has a, some gratitude. So yeah, thank you for the question. I really appreciate that because I think other people probably uh, benefited from that as well. There's a lot of people that have shoulder issues and I've, I've talked about shoulder issues in the past. Uh, one of the best things that you can do for your shoulder in the beginning is stop sleeping on it. If you're a side sleeper and you have a rotator cuff tear, uh, that spending you know hours with that kind of pressure on the shoulder is not uh, benefiting the healing of the rotator cuff. So uh, you know sleeping is a kind of an intimate thing. It's hard to change sleeping patterns for people, but if you can sleep on the other side or any other position. Um, that is a way to allow some healing to happen in your shoulder, in your rotator cuff. Um, all right, so we're going to go up to the top of the chat, and um, I will announce the Student Hub Student of the Week after that. So let's change screens here. We've got Kyle Morgan first. And he says, in CBT, you mentioned that the best way of sitting was to use a chair with no back. Does that advice still hold true for those of us who work at a desk and have to sit quite a bit throughout the day? That is a fantastic question, Kyle. So no, it doesn't apply to you because you're sitting excessively. You're sitting beyond the normal amount that humans were designed or evolved, however you want to look at it, to sit. And so uh, you got to give your body some help. And uh, what I recommend, and I think I'm have I, I've said this in the past and I can't remember where so I'll just say it again is to have the option to have a backrest but don't use it all the time so you know it would be crazy to ask anyone to their core and their spine to be able to tolerate sitting for four hours at a time you know eight hours in a day uh, without a backrest so if that's what you do for your job and, you know, maybe a standing desk isn't an option or something like that, then just have a chair that has a backrest and use it intermittently when, you're, when your muscles need a rest. And, 
You know, there are there are chairs that allow for, you know, what I recommend is a chair that that acts like a stool. So what I mean by that is it's flat on the top and it's not like it's not I'm going to go full screen for this. So a lot of chairs, if you look at the part that you sit on, the seating surface, it's actually slanted back, which forces you to lean back in, into the backrest. It's like it's like uncomfortable to sit straight up and down on these types of chairs because it's like kind of bending your spine. Um, it's like flexing your spine a bit much. So what I recommend is finding a chair that has more of a flat seating surface. So it'd be like sitting on a stool or a, or a stump or, a, a, you know, a more natural slanted surface and when you're not using the backrest. And then um, it, that one that also has a backrest available so that you can lean back, um, maybe the chair tilts back, um, you know, you, can, you have all the options with what chairs can do these days um, so that you can get that rest and maybe take 15 minutes like that and then get back to active sitting, which is using your core muscles. So fantastic question. Hopefully that helps. You say you're currently in module seven and your main symptom that doesn't seem to be easing up is muscle twitching in the calves while sitting. Oh, that's an interesting symptom. Um, I'm right here reading and I would associate that with the, with your back if you if, uh, i'm assuming you're associating that with your back uh just maybe some nerve compression in the in the lumbar that's causing a twitching and i what i would say to that is you know nerves we there's not a lot of control we can have over nerve compression other than just trying to decompress your spine and provide stability and allow that to work its way out but if it's twitching man, I would feel grateful. And I personally, I would say, you know what, I'm okay with that, because it could be a lot worse. And there's a lot of power in being okay with yourself with your body, having a little bit of pain or a little bit of discomfort. Um, and I'd say pain, but what the twitching doesn't actually seem painful. But this applies to anyone that has pain that's chronic, to be able to say, hey, I've got some pain and i can be okay with it it's actually something i can tolerate i'm okay with you and uh, a lot of the times having that mindset will allow the pain to not have so much power over you anymore and and when pain doesn't have power over you anymore it's not as scary and it's not as um it doesn't have that psychological impact and oftentimes i think that it actually gets better because of that and so, um, yeah, that, that's the way I would look at the twitching and, you know, for other people in that situation, um, that it helps with the patience as well as we're working these imbalances out of our body. Uh, Sherry, the, one of the main core members we have had since the beginning, um, I have been given some insight and I think your message is going to say what I've already been told. It says, hi, Ryan, I will be taking a break from CBT, and I just wanted to express my gratitude to you, your team, and this program you developed has been a real life changer and continues to get better and better. I hope to come back to finish the program at some point. Until then, best wishes to you and your family, and thank you and the whole team sincerely for everything. Oh, my gosh, Sherry, I can't say enough about how grateful I am and the team has been uh, to have you be part of the core balance training community. You've definitely been such a positive force for us and for other students giving encouragement and just what a, an amazing story you have, uh, you know, of, of continually getting up and facing uh, challenges and overcoming them and, and continuing to have challenges and not giving up. That's the main thing. So, um, so thank you for being here and we appreciate you and I just want to honor you Sherry for being here you know I'm told that you've you've been to every single stream uh without fail and so that's that's just incredible so thank you for showing up for for yourself um so we will yeah we'll miss you while you're taking a break Sherry yeah 
So Mo, I hope uh, the stream's going okay uh, as far as no skipping or anything. I don't know. I'm getting some notifications. So Mo says, hi, Dr. Ryan. What would you recommend for cardio exercises for someone with pelvis and torso and SI pain? Would elliptical machine be okay? So the thing that uh, my opinion about the elliptical machine is it. I've, I've done it before and I I'm, I have the ten tendency to be a quad dominant person, so overusing my quads, and I found that the elliptical really burns my quads, and that's a sign that it's working the quads heavily and is not a good strategy for someone that's trying to break out of a quad dominant movement pattern. And so I prefer walking than elliptical, and if you're trying to get some cardio, more cardio than walking, uh, you can, you know, walk do hills, uh, you know, you're walking up a steep hill is an excellent thing, or you have a treadmill that on an incline, um, and you can just turn up your walking kind of intensity. And I think it's a lot more of a balanced exercise than an elliptical, but, um, you know, it may just be me. I could be wrong about that. Um, so you also ask, what would I recommend for cardio? Yeah. So walking hills, walking at an incline treadmill or hills, if you don't live in an area with hills, then then treadmill would be uh, ideal and put it on a steep incline and really use those glutes and, and work those glutes and, and make sure your core is engaged. That's fantastic. And then the the other thing that I really love is stand up paddling. So uh, if you have water nearby, then stand up paddling, you know, supping. If you, I put out a YouTube video on the form and a technique for someone like, you know, a beginner to on supping, uh, fantastic full body exercise and cardio. And you can also do a machine, you know, they, you have uh, cable machines in the gym that you can simulate uh, the motion of stand up paddling as well. All right, so uh, pelvic torsion. Yeah, so I think that was in re reference to your comment above. Yeah, so yeah, your cardio is important. Yeah, I'm glad that you're thinking about that. And and um, if they again, if uh, back to elliptical, if it feels okay to you, then you that's something you can do. If you uh, you know, just pay attention to where you're feeling the burn. You'd rather feel the burn in your glutes, maybe your hamstrings and your core, than if it's super focused in your quads that might be contributing to a little bit of an imbalance. All right, so uh, Connie, can you please come in on more on the posterior tilt and how that integrates with walking uphill, downhill, and stairs? So you must be in module six, I believe, the walking week. And uh, posterior tilt. So we're not necessarily trying to live in a posterior tilt, Connie. Um, I think when we're talking about hills, we're doing more of the pelvis is is not moving independently of the torso, right? So the torso sits on the pelvis. We'll look at uh, Scully there. So how do I point at Scully? So you can see the spine sitting on top of the torso on on top of the pelvis. So that's your torso sitting on your pelvis. And that's the foundation. That's the base of the spine. So when we're talking about pelvic tilt, we're talking about that pelvis tilting forward and back independently, not in the, completely independently, but in relation to the spine. So the pelvis tilts uh, and the spine is uh, not tilting. In, and when we're talking about a hip hinge, the pelvis tilts, but the spine goes with it. So the spine in relation to the pelvis doesn't move. And that's what you want to be doing when you're walking hills. So I guess I can stand up and show you the difference here. So this is what we want. So this is the hip hinge. Yes, my pelvis is tilting here. My pelvis just tilted forward, but it's not an anterior pelvic tilt because it's not in relation to my spine. My spine moves with it. And that's what we want to do when we're walking up a hill. We're going to be walking more like this um, because we're, we're dealing with gravity. And then when we're walking downhill, we're going to be just normal open, but we're going to be allowing a little bit more extension to go into the hips 
rather than into the spine arching back. So downhill is not really a posterior pelvic tilt. This, the torso is going to remain in neutral and you're going to be connecting your anchors just like an anchor triad but that allowing instead of arching back to counter the downhill you're going to just allow more extension going into your hips and that uh, that requires a lot of core stability and control of your core muscles so hopefully that makes sense to you connie all right so uh fuzzer we've got i'm watching during a car ride not driving <laughs> all right yeah i hope it works for you too thank you for sharing fuzzer barbara dickinson i already answered that one mo could you comment on get fat concept and if we should use it when walking or sitting as well so get fat uh this is a common question so what i think i need to do is i need to put in a message about this in the get fat lesson get fat is not necessarily a technique Get fat is a check and balance for making sure that your core is engaged the right way. The technique is the core anchors and connecting, say, to your back anchor is going to naturally create this fattening of your core muscles. They expand. And when you um, connect to your back anchor on the floor like the back anchor awareness that happens automatically you get fat automatically but when you get up off the floor connecting to your back anchor is a little bit more uh, abstract you may not be sure that you're doing it right and so a way to check that you're doing it right is to check that you're getting fat and so it's more of a test or just a check with your fingertips to see if your deep core muscles are engaged and if they are they are they are expanded they're not sucking in a, su a, a deep core muscle uh, a core that is sucked in does not have uh, engaged deep core muscles like the obliques so that i hope that clarifies things for you that you you want to use as your technique when you're sitting and standing and walking just core anchor connection back anchor front anchors and if you want to check that they're, that you're connected you do the get fat test is what we should probably call it so that is that it's the it's a concept yeah um and so yeah sitting is the same thing pushing away from your sit bones and and your anchors you should have just a little gentle engagement in your deep core muscles it's going to be super subtle two percent maybe 5%, not like, you know, rock hard abs type situation. That's not sustainable. Um, and you can just kind of feel with your fingertips. Is there a tiny bit of activation in those muscles? That's asking, am I getting fat? It's not saying, okay, I need to get fat as a technique. Um, the technique is connect to your anchors. All right, so Stian, as I gradually get better and less pain, I'm less able to tilt my pelvis intentionally, the old painful way. Can it be the hypermobility that fades out in the muscles around the hip stabilizing? Oh man, this is a, this is a great understanding. Yeah, so Stian, yes, this is what's happening. So when you have a hypermobility, it's not just the muscles that are, are moving too much, it's all the all the tissues, the ligaments, the tendons, the discs, everything is lax and loose. And when you create stability in your spine, which is what you do with your muscles, you strengthen those deep core muscles that stabilize your spine, and you can maintain that for a long enough period of time, let's say months, those other tissues start to get some more tone in them. They start to stiffen up a little bit because they're not constantly every day getting waved in the wind by your motion they are more their motion is more controlled and so they lose a little bit of that laxity in that in the in the flapping in the wind and so if you don't take a tissue into that full range of motion regularly it does create a little bit of stiffness or or tone um in those motions that there's not regularly going into and that's a good thing in our case if we're trying to create stability for our spine it really helps out when the other static tissues because ligaments are static they're not they don't we don't have 
control over them like we do over muscles. Muscles are the only thing that we can move and tighten up with our mind. Um, the, the other tissues are just, they're static in the sense that they only tighten up or loosen up based on the what's been happening to them over a period of time. And so, yeah, it, it's really helpful when ligaments and tendons and fascia and other tissues get a little more tone in them to help support your spine and makes your job easier. So fantastic observation. Uh, Charlotte, hello, I'm at the end of your course and able to do a lot of things without or less pain than before. I am planning on a ski trip and wondering what kind of exercises you can recommend in preparation for the ski trip, I am assuming. So um, skiing is sagittal. So the program is going to be fantastic for sagittal. And you said you're at the end of the course. So I would recommend um, running man. I would recommend for your so the the main risk with skiing obviously everybody knows is knee injury and that's because of a lateral force hitting your knee so pre preventing a knee injury um, the typewriter squat is a really excellent uh, knee stability um, exercise to just develop that lateral control um, with your body and lateral forces and those are those are both exercises at the end of the program um and i would say if you are in an area with hills i would say walking and you can increase the intensity of your walking up and down steep hills is a fantastic preparation for skiing because your body is getting used to that those different angles of gravity working through it which when you're skiing and you're on a slope gravity is actually working through you like this right and so we're used to having gravity work through us like this and so walking hills is a great way to mimic that and you can get real steep with your hills and uh, that practice the core anchors and get that cardio um, that I was mentioning earlier from doing the hills um, other exercises, you know, sagittal plane exercises, front, which is front to back, uh, would involve, um, you know, you could do cables at the gym. If you have access to the gym, you can do cables and be pulling the cables um, in a what they would call a like a cross country skiing motion and um, really be engaging your core anchors during that motion. So it's a hip hinge with added arm um, dynamic motions. And that's really challenging your ability to stay connected to your anchors and also provides you some great cardio. So for the person that asked about cardio, um, that would be, that's one I like as well. Yeah, so the cro I think they call it cross country skier, um, I don't know, cable, cable pulls, something like that. All right, where are we at here? Elsa, I like this progression and dynamic. Yes, thank you for the feedback on that, Elsa. Jen, is active sitting on the Q, I don't know that, aerial chair that has an adjustable height with a flat, firm seat that tilts and wobbles in all directions a good or bad idea? I bought this expensive chair recently. It sounds expensive with a name like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just give it a quick search because I think I could just see a lot just from a picture of it. Oh, okay. Seeing a picture. It looks like there's different models of it. And uh, I think maybe other people might be interested to see that. So let's do this. Uh-oh, what happened? Give me a sec. Let's try that again. So this is what I'm seeing. And I think that you're talking about one with a backrest. So maybe like that one maybe like this one. Um, I think I've seen this before. My, I think a friend had this, uh, my friend who's a physical therapist. And yeah, it's really interesting. I don't think it mimics, my thoughts on this is I, I don't think it mimics nature so much, but it is contoured in a way that seems really healthy. And I like it, yeah. It looks like they put a lot of thought into this. I also like the tilt stool. Um, so 
typically I like to I like to use things that mimic nature, like a tree stump, right? So that's like a stool. Um, but I've tried this, and it, they, the one they that I tried didn't have a backrest, but I like the option of having a backrest. And yeah, I can see that it is flat from front to back. Um, so yeah, good question, and um, maybe I should give this one a test and see uh, if I can have some better thoughts on it for for you guys. Yeah, thank you for the question, and those are my thoughts for now. All right, I love this gradual progression. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, we'll miss you, Sherry, but uh, I know that you've got other things to focus on. And uh, yeah. All right, so Stein, here we go. We've got, I'm dealing with this click thing. All right, here we go. Stein, pushing into the back anchor and pelvis raise up. I can feel my right side tightens up and contracts between ribs and ASIS. The left does not and feels loose. The left side is my painful side. Any tips? Yeah, the tip is that the looseness of your left side and the pain of your left side are most likely related. And so anything that you can do, I remember, Stein, that you struggled a lot with your glutes, getting them activated in the beginning. And it seems like you have put a lot of work into that and have since made a lot of progress activating your glutes from almost nothing, like full gluteal amnesia may need some some persistence like that with this left side to get it to start feeling like the right side. So it's going to be a lot of mental focus on that left side, getting it to activate, getting it to feel more like the right side. And it's a good thing that you have that right side because you can use it as a uh, kind of a biofeedback, like a mirror to try to to be a gauge or a calibration for that left side so you can feel your left side and know what it's supposed to feel like uh, by feeling the right side and and work towards that so that's actually a good thing that it's 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 one-sided um, so that's that's the uh, focus and you know every exercise you do you're going to want to be trying to focus more on that left side and getting it to engage and feel that uh, you know, that lo looseness go away. Uh, Jen F, the Q, where did, uh oh, lost you. The Q chair uh, requires me to use my legs to prevent me from sliding forward off the tilted seat and use my core to stabilize the wobbling. I might be increasing the use of my hip flexors. Yes, this is a true thing. Similar to sitting on a an exercise ball or a Swiss ball that's blown up really really full, uh, you know, with a lot of, um, you know, air pressure in it, uh, you have to use your legs and your core is engaged more to maintain balance. And that can backfire a little bit because uh, your hip flexors might be the dominant muscle firing pattern that you've had for 10 years. And so guess which muscle group is going to be the main one helping you to stabilize. And so in order to break out of that pattern, uh, we have to turn down the intensity and we have to practice uh, in a more controlled environment. And balancing on a wobbly ball, you know, unfortunately is not a controlled environment. So the floor, the stability of a firm floor is a controlled environment and we got to work up to stuff like that. So Jen, yeah, it's a good observation, fantastic observation. I would say, I would suggest using this QOR chair um, intermittently while you can have feel like you have a little bit of control and really focus on your core and then when you feel like you're losing that sense of control and your hip flexors are coming in and compensating I would give it a break and if there is an adjustment where you can tighten up the wobbling that is happening in the chair um, and make it less wobbly that might be a good thing to do and the, the sliding forward off the chair is also not uh, is not really like a natural type feeling, right? So um, these are all feelings that you that you know the the sliding forward you wouldn't necessarily feel if you're sitting on a stump, so or a rock, right? Unless the rock was slippery and slanted. So so you know it might require putting a piece of material on the chair that's not like leather and slippery um, that can just help hold you in place. That might be a solution to the sliding forward um, and then tighten up the wobbling if you can and uh, and use the chair intermittently. Yep. 
when you can feel that control. Uh, Claudia, when I sit after a short time, I have a sharp pain above my iliac crest on both sides. All right, both sides, iliac crest. If I push on it, it doesn't hurt. It, it doesn't hurt when standing. Suggestions. Um, so it's not a tenderness feeling. It's more of a nerve feeling. And it seems to me like your body is communicating to you uh, that sitting is not its favorite thing right now after a short time. So um, the goal will be able to, to be able to build up the tolerance to sitting, but I wouldn't, I don't have any recommendations for like a, like a technique or strategy that can avoid that sharp pain after sitting for a short time. I think that the work that you need to do is to be uh, breaking up your sitting and, and, and try and take uh, rest breaks before that sharp pain comes on because sharp pain is bad pain and see if you can not bring it on as often and do things on the side like getting down on the floor and connecting to your core and and strengthening your your deep core and stability muscles on um on the side as a complementary thing so that you can also build up your your spine and torso's tolerance to sitting which is just frankly not a healthy activity it's not healthy for me it's not healthy for um most of the people that i know so uh, those are my best suggestions for you, Claudia. I hope that helps. Barbara, you are very welcome. I think that that was in reference yep, to my, my answer from earlier. All right, so we're coming up on the last question. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to do the Student Hub Student of the Week. And we will be uh, signing off at 1 o'clock today. So I will do as many of the questions that I can below the last question mark. Uh, up until one o'clock. Yep. So that's how that's going to work. All right. So we are at Ellen and she says the side plank feels awkward and somewhat painful. I understand the concept, but I can't do it successfully. So that is going to be where we bring in a modification and I like to call it a regression. So a progression would be advancing an exercise. A regression is going to be making it easier. And uh, in the lesson that we filmed for side plank just recently, we talk about the um, regression a lot, which is the side plank on the knees. And I believe that is also in the current lesson in the program. So that's no different. And we are talking about just maybe instead of trying to hold the side plank, we come up in the way that I teach, which is like bridging forward to prevent that shearing in your spine. So your hips are back and you're in the side plank, getting ready to get in the side plank position, your hips are back and you kind of bridge forward into the side plank on your knees and then come back again. So you're not really holding the position of the side plank. You're just bridging forward, sitting back, bridging forward, sitting back. And it's kind of a dynamic motion and, and it doesn't require you to hold that side plank, which is an awkward thing to do. It's awkward for anyone. Like it's not really that, it's not a common feeling or motion or, or stress that we experience. So uh, it's awkward for me to do a side plank too. Um, but the pain is what I have an issue with, especially if it's bad pain. So uh, the regression is the way to do it. And the goal is to build up your body's tolerance and gradually progress towards a uh, holding the side plank a little longer. Um, hopefully that helps. So Patty, this will be the last question before I go to the student hub, student of the week. Hi, Dr. Ryan, what are your views as regards to long distance cycling and SI joint pain? Is this something which is likely to aggravate it? long-term due to the amount of sustained hip flexion for hours. I think, Patty, that your intuition is most likely got to have some truth to it. Uh, it's also my intuition. Uh, what I see with long distance cycling is sustained exercise in the fetal position or the sitting position. And so we're training the hip flexors in a shortened position. And I also see a um, the SI joint issue most commonly and directly associated with chronic tightness in one or both hip flexors. And so that is pulling on the ilium into a anterior position 
where there are other forces and torques on the sacrum, maybe pulling it into a posterior position, and the, that torque is going straight into the SI joint. So the goal for people who are into cycling, and I understand that cycling is like running or like surfing or like rock climbing. It's one of those sports that people are very dedicated to. It's a little bit addictive and uh, some people aren't willing to quit. And so what you got to do is you got to modify and you got to you got to cross train before and after. So before you get on that bike, bridging is a great cross training exercise because it's the opposite of sitting. It's opening up your hip flexors. Uh, the front anchors awareness and progression are excellent because you're training uh, op the opening of your hips, um, you know, the marching progression of the front anchors awareness and push away. Uh, those are in module two if you need to review those uh, before and after the cycling. And walking is an excellent one too, before and after. And if you can take if you do tend to take any breaks from uh, your bike while you're on a long ride, then I would not spend those breaks sitting or even just standing still, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid. You, you should be walking, moving, opening up those hips or getting down on the floor and opening up those hips. But I also understand that, you know, your quads are probably burning quite a bit. So, um, so bridging might not be something that you quite desire to do on a break from cycling. So, um, yeah. And then I'm assuming you're going to have clip on pedals, which is going to help distribute that force more evenly throughout your leg muscles. So those are my thoughts on that. It's going to be cross training. Um, if this is something that you avidly do and are not willing to, you know, reduce the amount yeah, and replace it with something, another activity that's more open and upright, such as stand up paddle boarding or, you know, people talk already about skiing, um, you know, other other outdoor activities. All right. So uh, thank you for those questions, guys. I thought today's questions have been so far excellent questions. I've enjoyed answering them. So thank you for for asking them, everyone. And we're going to go to this so today's student hub student of the week is Carmen Barnhart. And uh, yeah, we, I, we got a special acknowledgement to Carmen because of an inspiring just setback and recovery, setback and just like determination to not give up that uh, she's experienced. So uh, yeah, it's sh sharing in the student hub about um, a setback and, and just you know, just the reaction. It's not about what happens to you. It's about what you do about it. It's about your reaction. It's about your ability to get up and keep moving and not give up. And so uh, it's been inspiring for us to see that, Carmen. And thank you for sharing a little bit about your story. You know, it takes courage to share stuff like that. It helps a lot of people. It's inspiring. And, and we wanted to recognize you for that. So uh, congratulations, you're the student of the week, and we're going to add a month to your membership. You have to do nothing. We will add it from the back end. And she also had this message she wanted to share. So it is, uh, I think many of us who are in pain want to charge to the finish line. I agree with you, Carmen. And never have pain again, but progress, progress isn't linear. So uh, that is uh, something that I've talked about in the past. This, this is not reality. This is not achievable. This is not a goal. It shouldn't be a goal. We're all going to continue having pain and being okay with some pain is part of being a human. So um, that's not the goal. No, the goal is to get out of a spiral of chronic pain that stays in the same spot and doesn't go away. But, you know, if you get out of chronic back pain, it doesn't mean you're not going to have back pain sometimes if you mistreat your body going along car ride and you get a little back pain that happens to me and that's okay so so the goal is to have control over your body that's the goal and that doesn't involve charging to the finish line it involves patience and persistence and taking it slow so i just love this message um carmen says i learned that when i'm feeling good i still need to take things slowly and uh 
you know, I do have something I want to comment. That's very true. And I, I have a comment that may educate people about this. So when people have an injury to tissues in their body and then they start healing and doing the right thing, those tissues heal and you start to feel better. And there is a period of time. It's a window of time when you're feeling good and you feel like your tissues, you feel like your injury is better. But those tissues have, haven't actually developed full strength yet. Your body just feels good because you've been doing the right thing and, and the tissues are no longer getting damaged. But it takes months for those tissues to develop full strength. I'm talking about ligaments. I'm talking about discs. They heal, but they're not quite as strong as they should be yet. And you are feeling good. So this window of time is a vulnerable period where it is smart for you to be aware of that. Say, I'm not going to take it to full extreme. No, I'm not going to push it. I know that I'm feeling good and I'm grateful about that, but I'm not going to abuse my body just because I'm feeling good quite yet. And, and th those tissues, if you can get through this period of time of feeling good, but tissues still not strong yet, and they do get strong because you got to get through that period of time without having too many setbacks to allow them to get strong, then you could probably get away with abusing your body a little bit. Uh, but that when it's aware, it's a, it's a, Cool. The, the knowledge can give you that power to be aware. Like, all right, I know what's going on here. I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna do what I'm doing that it got me to this point, and uh, give my body some more time to get some more collagen fibers in the, in those tissues and strengthen them up before I go start, you know, go to the extreme. So, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful message uh, from Carmen. Thank you, and. Uh, We've got about seven more minutes left, so I'm going to go back to the chat. I don't think there were any prepared questions today. So uh, the t team CBT, you know, Melody and Kara and Becky and Esther and Marina and Osti all answering questions, helping students out. Thank you guys. Uh, when 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 I get to a week with no questions coming to me it means you guys are doing an amazing job and people are getting their questions answered so thank you guys for for help helping support the cbt movement uh, i'm super grateful to you so we've got a question from kate brown who uh, had a beautiful message for us uh recently that we have saved in our um like t little secret hidden testimonial vault um, and I don't know if we have permission from you, Kate, to share your message, but it was a beautiful message about uh, your progress and everything. And um, we're always so happy to read that. So thank you. Uh, what do you have to say? Many thanks for your skill and clarity, Dr. Ryan. Do you have any update on the stem cell treatment you had a month or so ago? Thanks again. Yeah, good question, Kate. So I do have an update. Um, nothing major, but it's feeling slight, maybe slight improvement in my ability to <laughs> I'm gonna say this because it's true kind of abuse my body and take advantage of my body uh, and still tolerate tolerate it more and the reason I say that is because we're in the middle of a move I've been you know moving furniture and boxes like every day it's amazing how much goes into a, a move when you have a family in and not having time to do my exercises daily at all uh just not having the time and i'm surprisingly feeling um still pretty good but i will tell you that the what i've learned about stem cells is that you really shouldn't feel any difference in the first month or even the second month that the 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 changes take months to happen for the cells to actually grow and develop into whatever tissue that they're going to become and uh it's really around month three to four that you people should start feeling changes or improvement if any and then you know up to six months up to a year that can continue to progress and so i'm still a little too early to where i shouldn't really be feeling much but uh, i don't know if i'm ever going to feel much of anything at all so so that's just where i'm at and, and if anybody has immediate improvement from stem cell injections it's only because 
the stem cell injections have an immediate effect of anti-inflammatory effect uh, on your body. And so it's, it's because they have these properties in them that reduce inflammation in your body, and that's a temporary effect. So anyone who comes to you and said, I got stem cell injections, I felt incredible right away. It's a temporary anti-inflammatory effect, and that actually doesn't last forever. It should, you know, normally that should just be temporary and it'll, and it'll return to normal. And it really takes months for the stem cells to do their job, which, you know, the permanent thing is the growing into the tissues, whatever they're going to form into. So a good question. Uh, happy to update on that, Kate. Uh, D Texas Wheeler, already stretching. I know static stretching isn't necessarily best, not teaching muscles, but for sheer desire to stretch things out, what do you think about swinging? So swinging would be considered ballistic stretching, and they teach in, cor in a, uh, physical therapy school that it's bad. But, you know, I actually think that because, and the reason they teach is bad is because there's no control and it's kind of stressing the joints and their capsules to end range and it's just kind of stressful on the tissues. Um, you see ballistic stretching a lot in uh, Qigong, uh, I think, where they're swinging their arms forward and back, stuff like that. Uh, I think that's what you're talking about, swinging, right? Um but my belief on swinging or ballistic stretching is that if you can do the motion in control, then it can be a phenomenal uh, exercise for you. Uh, it would be controlled swinging. So not ballistic out of control swinging, but controlled. And um, if you, yeah, it's, it's a really good way to loosen up joints and, and get things moving. And uh, it's kind of almost a little bit of a type of manipulation to the joints if you need that. Uh, I would say controlled swinging I'm okay with. It's just, are you actually in control is the question. And that, that's kind of a hard thing to do. So you want to start small with little swings. If you're doing hip swings or you know hip uh, flexion extension swings, you want to start real slow and make sure that force isn't, going into your lumbar spine and torquing your L5 disc. So that that's the kind of thing you want to be aware of. With. And you, you always want to start real small. So that's my thoughts on that. What kinds of dynamic stretching is good? Or you can point me to any videos on this topic. Uh, the, my favorite type of dynamic stretching is yoga. So that that's what I, I kind of hand people at the end of the program. The way it ends now is I kind of we go into a common yoga pose that's similar to like the warrior pose. Um, we apply the anchors to it. And then I kind of say, you know, this is this is a way to do health, healthy yoga. Uh, because before before the, developing the core connection, I myself and many other people actually hurt their spine doing yoga because it's it's such a, you know, the way that it's taught in the West is, well, let's, let's get your body into these extreme positions and hold it. And uh, that's what's good for you. But really, um, you got to have a healthy balance in your posture and your core for yoga to be good for you. And if you don't, if you have an imbalance, you have a chronic problem, those stretches might be just be going straight into the problem that not might, but they will be if you don't have control over it. So we develop that spinal stability and that control. And then we learn how to get into some yoga positions while maintaining that core connection. And that is my favorite type of dynamic stretching. Yeah, uh, I don't have any videos on specifically on dynamic stretching, but in the program, we have two lessons on it. I think it's in module 11, the very last module, uh, D Texas Wheeler, if you're in the program. So, all right, Jeffrey McKenzie, and I think this will be my last question because I um, we are at one o'clock. So we've got, uh, when using a treadmill for incline walking, is there a point that the incline is too much? Is there an ideal incline amount? Or do you just go for your desired fitness level? You know, I would say that the best thing is going to be variety. So I would go super steep if you can for a little while. And then when you start to feel the burn, too much in one area, maybe it's the quads, maybe it's the calves, probably the calves, uh, then you then lower that incline. And that's going to mimic hiking up a hill or a mountain because the earth is shaped like this, right? 
And so uh, that's that's really what we're going to want to do. And there is no place on earth that is a, a steady incline for as long as a treadmill goes, right? So you wouldn't want to do the same, always do the same incline uh, indefinitely. You want to change up and give your body that variety and try to mimic going up a real hill or a real mountain where incline actually changes. So uh, great question there. And um, I made an, I accidentally read Connie's next question, so I'm going to have to answer it because I read it. But then I'm going to I'm going to sign off. So that's uh, this will be the last one. So I have posterior tail. I'm having to translate every training to address it. This is my this is my question. How to what and fix posterior tail. Um, so you can actively correct a posterior tilt right by arching your back by anteriorly tilting your pelvis uh, but that's not a natural feeling and that's not a functional way to move around and i just frankly don't think it lasts so what i would do is applying the anchors to you connie is i would spend more time in the front anchors awareness position and I would feel very free to be doing uh, the the front anchors push away, module two, and be very free with how much you can lift your legs and your upper torso, and be okay with a little bit of extension going into your lumbar spine. And I would apply that to the front anchors challenge and the bridge, and just be um, training your body in that way with subtle movements and also just strengthening those muscles. And then when you are, um, you know, doing something like the, the anchor triad, that posture correction, I would be probably less focused on the back anchor connection and more focused on maybe the upper front anchor connection would be my primary focus for you. So, um, you know, anyone with a posterior pelvic tilt is going to have uh, excessive rounding of their spine. And if you can get more open in your upper back, that will n require your lower spine to, to tilt forward more. And or, uh, otherwise, you would be leaning backwards all day. And so you want to open up up here and and then I think that that's might be related to the root of the problem. And, and then naturally your spine may be allowed to shift forward. So uh, that would be my re recommendation to you, um, Connie. And I will say you say all the training addresses anterior tilt, but um, all the training is based on human natural human development, infant and baby development. And so it's it's only addressing posterior to uh, anterior tilt in the sense that it's the most common thing that people deal with 80% I would say um, but that's more later in the program in the beginning of the program we're dealing with infant and baby development and they use the floor and they push away from it and the people that uh, have had posterior tilt and gone through the program have had success. Uh, we've had a really great success with some people who live in posterior tilt um, by going through the program. And I think it's just because we're modeling after human development. It's not really tar targeted towards one or the other. It's just modeling after what we already know what works. Um, and one of the people who had success with a posterior tilt in the program is a physical therapist here in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, he was unable to. Uh, could do th fun things anymore with his kids and he and he has he's one of our testimonials that says i'm now skating half pipes and surfing with my son and and back to back to life again and he he was living in a posture tilt and you know he was a pt so so i always felt like that gave a little more credibility um because a pt already knows all the exercises it's not about the exercises it's about how you're doing them and, and, and using the floor and modeling after um, the way we originally developed. And it seems to work for both sides of the equation, anterior and posterior. So I appreciate that question because it does apply to, you know, 20, if it's 20% of people in posterior tilt, then that's a lot of people, right? So that's very applicable. And um, 
I think that is that is it for today. So thank you, everyone. We're at 106. I appreciate all of you for showing up live or catching the replay. And uh, until next time, get down on the floor and connect to your core. All right. Take care, everyone.